Good evening to all of you here in the Heinrich Bill Foundation. Warm welcome. My name is uh, Walter Kaufmann. I'm the head of uh, the Department of Eastern and South East Europe. Uh, I'm glad to see you all here, and I would like to warmly welcome all those who join us online. I think there is a lot to cover when we talk about the situation in Georgia right now, and uh, I'm really happy to see many of uh, you Georgians here in the room. Of course, uh, you are more affected than anyone else by the situation in your country. I would just like to give you a short introduction. I assume that the majority of you is well informed about uh, Georgia as a country, as well as about uh, the current situation in the country. Our title is a Georgian nightmare without end. And uh, the so-called Georgian dream, the party we're talking about, um, is um, on uh, in power since 2012 and organized by the billionaire Bitsina Ivanishvili. And uh, back then in 2012, Ivanishvili seem to be the necessary resource in order to break free from an authoritarian regime uh, that had become authoritarian in order to give room for a democratic change. Back then, this was a possibility. The uh, United National Movement from Saakashvili was um, um, ousted from the office and eventually assumed the office. But uh, now, in the last years, we see a turnaround. Uh, the regime becomes more and more authoritarian, and uh, the only objective seems to be to remain in power. And um, what has uh, been anchored uh, in the Constitution is the integration in the Western structures like the EU and NATO. Since December 2022, Georgia has become a member uh, for the candidacy in the EU and uh, this uh, together with uh, the Republic of Moldova. Uh, this is something that uh, people have not uh, thought possible. This is a direct consequence of the war of aggression in Ukraine uh, inflicted by Russia. But uh, although the candidate status is still maintained, or maybe because of that, uh, the party, the Georgian Dream, has um, approved a series of uh, laws, of bills, and has expressed a rhetoric that uh, is um, clearly against uh, a possible membership in the EU. We were talking about uh, the foreign agents law oriented in uh, the example of Russia in anti-LGBTQI law against the so-called uh, homo propaganda. And uh, quite massively, they uh, try to um, move against uh, the European institutions um, and um, have um, basically invented uh, the entire war party legend um, that um, tries to move against Russia like uh, Ukraine has uh, fought a war against Russia beforehand. Uh, so all that should be sufficient for now in order to give you an insight, an overview of the situation. And uh, from then, the parliamentary elections uh, that uh, have taken place on October 26 have been called uh, the elections of uh, destiny. Uh, that uh, we're supposed to answer the question if uh, Georgia keeps going down uh, the path uh, to the EU succession or if it turns away from the EU and uh, finally becomes a real authoritarian state um, and uh, automatically uh, we combine that uh, with the pro-Russian movement uh, and the direct influence of Russia. So the outcome of uh, the elections are quite clear. 54 percent is uh, what uh, the Georgian dream has achieved um, as an electoral outcome. And uh, the four position parties that have forged an alliance uh, have reached uh, 37 percent. Uh, we have massive criticism when it comes to electoral fraud, uh, intimidation, several cases of uh, multiple votings. Uh, so this is something that we will delve into 
continuation and uh, still we see demonstrations of uh, the opposition forces in Tbilisi and uh, the president Salome Sorabishvili that uh, has been here in Berlin by the end of September, beginning of October, in a meeting that was organized by us and has talked to, to us. Uh, she was supposed to talk to the Constitutional Court in order to uh, to weigh with the recent movement. Uh, she wanted to launch new elections, uh, not elections, and uh, the coalition asks um, a lot more support uh, from uh, the international community, the uh, non-approval of the illegitimate, uh, illegitimate um, outcome of the elections. And now, next Monday, 25th of November, the new parliament is supposed to convene, and shortly after, the new government is uh, supposed to be confirmed, and then afterwards, in December, a new president is uh, to be elected, uh, because uh, the mandate uh, of uh, Salome Sorabishvili is expiring by the end of this year. This is a very complex current situation, unfortunately, and we would like to talk about possible scenarios uh, that are to be expected for the coming weeks. Uh, what uh, is it uh, that uh, the democratic civil society is focused on? What uh, do they want to do in Georgia? And uh, what uh, is the main focus? Uh, the new elections uh, or the municipal elections, the regional elections that are to take place in next spring, who is um, the um, who is really behind everything? Is it uh, the Kremlin that uh, is uh, behind all of it, or is it uh, Bidzina Ivanishvili who tries um, to please the Kremlin? And what are the expectations when it comes to the European Union? What do you expect from Germany? And uh, what are the positions uh, that are discussed within the European Union and in Germany? And for that, I would like to warmly welcome our panelists. Uh, we have Georgi Tintaletza with us. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, Tamta Mikeladze. She is co-director uh, of the Social Justice Center in Tbilisi, a partner organization of uh, the Heinrich Böll Foundation, with uh, which we work together in a very trustful manner for many years. And the Social Justice Center is talking and uh, dealing a lot with human rights with a focus of social and environmental rights and um, the working population in Georgia and the very difficult social and economic situation in the country. Warm welcome, Tamta. Thank you for being with us. And then we have Georgi Cincelatze. He is uh, one of the co-founders of the Georgian Centra, uh, Center um, abroad. Uh, he lives and works here in Berlin, has studied architecture in Tbilisi and uh, for eight years. Uh, he has been working now in Berlin as an architect and uh, he will fill us in of uh, what it is like uh, to work uh, from abroad and be part of the electoral process and uh, how this felt for him. And uh, last but not least, uh, Sergei Lagodinsky, who is a member of the European Parliament. Um, he is um, the um, Deputy Chairman of uh, the Parliamentary Group of the Green Party in the European Parliament and uh, the Chairman of uh, the Parliament and Committee, the Euronest. Uh, this is the Parliamentary Commission of uh, the Eastern Partnership. So the countries, so Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, uh, Moldova, and Ukraine, uh, they set up uh, the uh, commission together with the European Parliament. Uh, so you are uh, chairman of um, the um, group of the European Parliament. So for many, many years, uh, you have filled different positions and have been actively involved in the region. Thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. Tamta, the first question for you. How did you perceive these elections or how did you experience them yourself um, and how would you position yourself on that question if this was a clear electoral fraud? Did we see manipulations that are difficult to, to reveal? So what is what really happened on the 26th of October? Good evening. Uh, it's a really great pleasure to be here, and thank you, Bell Foundation, for the for for this invitation. 
Um, so uh, now the climate in Georgia is very emotional. Uh, a lot of activists uh, and ordinary people are out in the streets uh, trying to seek some strategy and energy to, to resist. Um, and uh, yeah, we are lacking uh, the time and energy for deliberation and for discussions, um, the middle term and maybe long term uh, strategies for our country development. And for that's why such kind of discussions uh, are also very important for us to uh, to to discuss more about uh, our future. So yeah, your question is uh, really very important, and a lot of people um, abroad have the main question. Uh, so we can say that uh, Georgian government used uh, different schemes and strategies for the mobilization and demobilization of the voters uh, together. Yeah. So observer organizations and um, political parties reported widespread violations, uh, including violation of ballot secrecy due to the poor ballot quality and uh, this uh, issue now is uh, appealed uh, before the courts and um, local non-governmental organizations are uh, litigating the case uh, against this issue. We see the problems with uh, how election commissions were formed and uh, how it was difficult to monitor pre-appointed uh, process of uh, commission members it's about uh, the systemic voter control so through uh, call centers, coordinators, and administrative resources. And we observed micro uh, level control on the citizens' behavior, their needs, their fears. Uh, the, um, and their vulnerabilities coming from the government. Um, uh, it's about the demobilization of opposition votes, uh, which includes with the holding their IDs. Uh, it's about uh, widespread vote buying, and we observed several regions where the GD government uh, uh, bought uh, some money for the voters uh, to, to, to mobilize them. It's uh, now also a very aggressive environment for observers, more than 100 cases of harassment or expel of observers uh, were, uh, uh, um, uh, were reported. Uh, it's frequent cases of the violence, uh, large discrepancies between the exit polls and official results, which have never been uh, this high before. It is the violation of the, the principle of universality of the election, and uh, we saw, uh, we saw how, so how many people, how many Georgian citizens abroad uh, were interested to participate in the election, but it was, po was not possible for them to really participate. In. And only uh, 95,000 uh, citizens were registered uh, in uh, different uh, cities of the Europe, and not only. Uh, so it's very clear that, uh, and also some organizations are uh, reporting about alleged vote carousel schemes where the same persons voted multiple times. Yeah, so it's a lot of violations, different schemes, different patterns uh, of uh, manipulation, fabrication, and instrumentalization of, of the vulnerabilities of the voters. Uh, and it's very clear that they managed very well to mobilize their voters and to demobilize the opposition voters. Yeah? According uh, to the um, official results uh, uh, of the election, some, some, somehow it's a problem when I'm using the official results of the statistics because uh, it is disputable and it's not trusted by the society. But in any case, to show some tendencies, uh, when we are c uh, comparing uh, the results of this election to the 2021 local elections, we see that opposition's support grew by only 1,000 votes, uh, which, which is very uh, low, and the uh, GD government gained uh, nearly 300,000 votes additionally. When we are comparing this election to the 2020 election, it was parliamentary election, then GD uh, government gained over two. 100,000 additional votes, while the opposition increased by 43,000 votes only. 
So according to the results, government support comes mainly from the rural areas by the opposition born in the major cities. Yeah, it's about 65%, um, uh, and it's about 65% uh, of uh, the, the support opposition uh, gained in the major cities. So for me, these results demonstrate, um, uh, of course, the, the violations of, uh, of the, the, the basic principles of the election, but also it's demonstrate like the structural um uh, causes of the of the crisis, structural causes of the the support of authoritarian logic in our country, and we see that economically depressed uh, rural areas where the citizens are living in a very poor condition, and uh, we are um, observing high poverty and economic inequality, inequality to the excess of very basic social services, including education culture, healthcare, etc. we see how this structural problem related to the economic and uh, social uh, inequality and injustices is directly influencing uh, on the level and quality of democratization. Uh, and uh, in this respect, I would uh, specifically mention uh, uh, like different paternalistic uh, uh, programs government uh, uh, has. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's mostly the social and healthcare programs. Uh, they are also very effectively using uh, these programs for the uh, control of the citizens. Yeah? According to the, the surveys, uh, in 32 municipalities of 64 municipalities in Georgia, over 25% of the population receives social assistance. And in high municipalities, specifically in high mountain region, over half of the population receives the social assistance from the government. It is like very basic social uh, monetary support for the uh, the people, um, uh, and uh, the government is granting some so such social assistance, like the monthly uh, per month. And we see how such uh, program uh, is uh, used by the government to demobilize and to control the citizens. So, the, on the other hand, yes, we are talking about the manipulation, fabrication, the control of the citizens. Um, use uh, the, uh, the the money for the buying of the of the voters, but on the other hand, we see um, how uh, this how the quality, inequalities, uh, social and economic vulnerabilities. Uh, a very uh, low level of participation in the regions, um, the social and cultural polarization in the societies uh, um, helping the authoritarian logic and authoritarian regime um, uh, during the election. Uh, that's why my, uh, and uh, also I have to be somehow critical towards the opposition because uh, they failed uh, active work in the region they were mostly oriented to work in, in large cities, in urban areas, uh, but uh, their strategies, uh, even their language, discourses, party infrastructure in the rural areas were not sufficiently developed, and finally we find that found that their support in the in the, the regions, in the rural, rural areas is also very, 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 very weak. Um, also, when we are talking about the instrumentalization of vulnerabilities, we saw how efficiently GD government instrumentalized uh, the, the fears our society has regarding the war and the conflicts. Yeah, so. And this, uh, uh, can, we can say that it was the campaign uh, used by the government uh, during the election and even before. Um, they started to instrumentalize the, the war in Ukraine during the, the election. Uh, in the days before the election, the billboards in the city displayed images of Ukraine and Georgia contrasting Ukraine's ruined cities with the peaceful Georgian landscapes, churches, villages and the schools, yeah? And unfortunately, we saw how it was very difficult for the opposition to uh, to counter this narrative and to submit uh, the new vision of the peace and security under the Europeanization of Georgia, yeah? So 
yes, to, to, to finally respond to your question, yes, it was fraud, it was manipulation, uh, it was fabrication, uh, it was um, control of the citizens, but on the other side, it was instrumentalization of the vulnerabilities we have in the social sphere, in the cultural sphere, in, in our memories, and it was very efficiently managed by the government, and unfortunately, the, it was very difficult for opposition and maybe for the media and civil society in Georgia to develop progressive, positive alternatives to counter these uh, um, this uh, campaign and strategy used by the government. Thank you very much, Tamta Georgi. I was there at the event with the President Salome Surabishvili, and there was quite an optimistic mood in the room, so you could get the impression that many people were convinced. Uh, that October the 26th could bring about change. So how big is the disappointment now that things turned out the way they turned out, or the way you had feared, probably, or was the uh, election come out a surprise, and how was it for Georgians abroad? Thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. I think we have one. We have not lost, and the hope that we had on September the 29th uh, is what we have achieved. Basically, we had the election. Many people voted in favor of the EU and the future uh, within the EU of Georgia, but uh, the so-called Georgian dream is in reality a Russian dream, but they simply stole the election. Um, and through the manipulation, which Tamda has just explained, um, so I have been living in Berlin for the past eight years. So I was in Berlin during three elections. And there's never been so much activity in Berlin as now on October the 26th. Last year, in 2020, 20, rather, when we had the last parliamentary elections, the Georgian dream got more than 30 percent of the votes, and this time they got 6 percent from Georgians in Berlin. If we take Germany as a whole, in Germany, Georgian dream could hardly uh, pass the 5 percent threshold. Abroad, the Georgian dream only got 13 percent in 2020, it was more than 30 percent. So it's impossible that in Georgia, uh, 54 percent of the population voted for Georgian dream, and the Georgians abroad, and the prime minister calls us foreigners, we are not informed what or we are informed what the Georgian dream is doing. And we went to the polls and. So this has been a process which has been ongoing for quite a while. So in, uh, in Georgia, we, our compatriots are in the streets and they are fighting for freedom, for the European integration and for the uh, European uh, values. And they want to make sure that Georgia becomes part of the EU in order to not be afraid on a daily basis that the police might uh, detain them without any reason or justification. Um, to come back to your question, I think there is some frustration in Tbilisi and, of course, also uh, with us here uh, in Germany. But at the same time, there is also hope because this is a process where we have to keep on fighting because no one else will do that and we do not have another chance. Either we eventually win or we will end up as part of the Russian Empire, 
which is trying to shift its borders towards Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova. Well, we'll come back to the geopolitical implications in a moment, but maybe once again back to the election result. Within the EU, there have been deliberations or plans to send a technical mission to Georgia, which should then review the election result. So far, there has not been a recognition or non-recognition of the election result that Georgian dream, the government, has not yet said whether they want to receive the technical uh, team. So what is being discussed in Brussels as regards this election result and how should the EU deal with the results? What uh, is the EU waiting for? Thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. So first of all, it is about what will happen with the resolution that we are about to uh, set up. This will be discussed next week in the plenary session in Strasbourg and then also pass, be passed. I think that we have a cross-party consensus that, of course, we stand uh, at the side of the Georgian population, the pro-European -Euro movement. This is no doubt, of course. Unfortunately, we uh, cannot yeah, achieve miracles, uh, as some people might expect. So first of all, it's a decision by the Georgian people, and it's also the task of the Georgian people to uh, do what is necessary now, which is defending their democracy and defending their path towards the European Union. So our task is to learn from our mistakes, and I think the biggest mistake that we can see here now, and there is little debate about that at the moment, the biggest mistake is the, in, the lack of uh, confidence of countries like um, Georgia or Moldova that we as the European Union cannot only support or encourage these countries with our soft power to go into a pro-European direction, but that we are also prepared, if need be, to also make use of our hard power in order to defend these countries. So I think this is quite a good strategy of the Georgian dream to to stir up these fears or to make use of these fears and also our inability to um, defend, basically, uh, our values there. So this holds true for both countries, Moldova and Georgia. We have to tell people, you want to go there. We have, I mean, the Georgian dream says you have a neighbor which is very powerful. You have seen what is happening in Ukraine and where is the EU when it comes to Ukraine? This is just a half-hearted support when it comes to Ukraine, which uh, has been not really useful. So the same might happen in our country. And if we are honest, this is the actual mistake or the actual uh, complaint that one could make um, to say that I mean, we should say you're not only in our hearts, but we do stand by your side. And if necessary, we will also stand in front of you. I mean, in between you and an aggress aggressive Russian Kremlin. And this is something where that we have to think about or should think about. In Moldova, we have... We yeah, have been lucky, so to speak. Um, we will have to wait and see how the um, parliamentary elections turn out. But in Georgia, uh, the end result was not positive. This is um, number one. So second uh, aspect, I think we are here um, in a gray zone where authoritarian uh, regimes uh, are actually capable of using the ambivalence. Was it a manipulation? Was it no manipulation? Is it manipulation from Russia or is it a manipulation from the homegrown authoritarians? Um, and in such a um, very ambivalent situation, it is very difficult to 
position yourself not only for us as the EU but also to for the Georgian population to position itself and this is what we do see so from my point of view we should have been much more decided at a much earlier stage we do not acknowledge the result we want a recount or we want new elections or whatever we did not do that but if we are honest on the side of the Georgian opposition or the population, this was also not the immediate reaction. I mean, the quick signal should have been we take to the streets in masses and we want you or Europeans at our side. So I do not want to blame the Georgians, of course, um, but we should have played together, so to speak. We should have shown our decidedness um, on both sides, and this did not work out. And then the first days had passed, the energy was somehow lost, and of course we can now pass resolutions, but uh, combined with the fact that we have a lame duck as a commission, including Borrell, and Kalas is a little bit too late, I think if we would have had colors a month earlier, then we would have seen a different determination from the side of the EU. So I know you invited me to spread a little bit of optimism here, but um, unfortunately, uh, when it comes to this uh, situation, I'm a little bit pessimistic. And I have the impression that uh, we will have uh, discussions now which are wrong from my point of view, a discussion about the abolishment of the visa freedom for normal people, for Georgian citizens. So I'm looking forward to your position on that, but I think it's the wrong decision or would be the wrong decision, but it might be a, a reflex of the EU. So now you did not fulfill what you should have done. And I mean, we have had a similar situation with Turkey, um, but there we um, went one step farther. But um, Probably we will have hard-hearted sanctions against individual uh, parliamentarians. This is what the EU Parliament has already demanded. And of course, now we could say limitation of travel for those who actively uh, are active anti-Europeans. But other than that, I don't see it at the moment. And this is basically the tragedy of the current situation. Well, I will come back to uh, that in a moment. But now I would like to ask Tamta and Georgi, what is going to happen right now over the next weeks? What do you expect? Will there be will there be an attempt to stop the opening of the parliament, um, the first session of the parliament, or the election of a new president? Or what's the mood at the moment in Tbilisi? So now, uh, as I see, the main strategy of the part of the opposition is to increase international pressure on the government and, uh, and pushing for non-recognition of the election of democratic and fear, and they are trying to work with the, with the main international actors in this direction. And of course, they are trying to mobilize the public protests, especially around the day of official recognition of the results of the election uh, and uh, during the first gathering of the parliament and um um, and the main aim is to massively uh, resist against this event, yeah. Uh, but um, as I am observing the, the ongoing protests, uh, it looks that our society is quite tired, like because during two years we are actively participating in the streets, in the protests, so somehow we are exhausted. And, um, and maybe also there is the feeling among our citizens that uh, uh, now it's impossible to change something quickly. Uh, that's why maybe they are not joining massively the, the, the protests organized by the, by the uh, opposition. Uh, so uh, that's why it's somehow very difficult for me to predict like the nearest future, what will be, um, what kind of events or processes uh, uh, we have to expect, uh, but uh, it's very clear that we need uh, like the long-term uh, 
even middle term <laughs> strategy and the opposition is lacking uh, to have such strategy um, uh, and um, yeah uh, the main demand from the side of the opposition is now the, the to uh, to have the new election uh, but also it's very clear that they have to be ready for local elections and they have big chances to win big cities and then uh, it will be really very important uh, for our country's democratization to have the opposition in the local government and uh, to somehow balance uh, the uh, hyper majoritarian logic of governance of GD. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, it's very clear that uh, we need to respond to the, the structural reason of the, the poly crisis. Yeah, uh, yes, and I'm describing the crisis in Georgia as a poly crisis, as a multiple crisis. Yeah, on the one hand, we see this. Uh, uh, geopolitical uh, challenges related to the one Ukraine, this um, uh, uh, the na authoritarian neighborhood like the Azerbaijani, Turkey, Russia, um, yeah, uh, the, the the risk of uh, escalation coming from the the Russia, this hybrid war, etc. Uh, we have the problem and crisis with the government, which is becoming closer to the Russia, and they are totally breaking this logic of balancing against the EU now, yeah, uh, and they are becoming closer uh, with Russia and China and deepening uh, cooperation and trade with them. Uh, but also it's very clear that we have a problem of uh, social and cultural polarization, very deep mistrust towards the opposition and political parties, uh, it's regional inequality, which has uh, very clear social and economic uh, uh, sides. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's very clear and obvious for me that we have to respond to these structural challenges as well. Yeah. No, but um, uh, and maybe we need space and time uh, for, to agree what should be our future long term strategies. Um, yeah, but to be frank, it's very difficult to see like the nearest reality, nearest future. But I think that the opposition uh, really have the chances to win in the the, 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 the election in big cities and uh, uh, to create uh, like this institutional conflict, yeah, in in the system. Georgi, what is your expectation? You, uh, to some extent, sound a little bit more radical. I mean, you said that the Russian dream had stolen the election. So is this um, a situation where we can't do anything about it? Is an impasse? Or is there still room for medium and long-term work? Uh, or has this... Um, struggle of power now decided and Russia now has taken over, uh, so everything is over? What do you say? Well, I would like to say that I'm not more radical, but I think I'm calling things by their name. So when we look at the situations but never call things by their name. So an aggression is not called an aggression or whatever. Um, and we still discuss in Georgia, for example, whether there's been a distortion uh, or manipulation or whether the result was correct. So we should really look at things straight forward. There was electoral fraud. The Georgian population did not show any signs of this um, election result. And all the methods that were used, I mean, one very important method is that the paper on which you voted was transparent. And everyone could see where you put your cross, whether the governing party or the opposition. And if you threaten the people with these um, things. And, and um, we found out, for example, that 
the Georgian dream would, was going to forge the election. So someone told us, someone who was an insider, who knew the system and knew how it worked, and that person told us that 5 to 10 percent of votes could be gained through these falsifications, but um, I think it can even be 25 percent. And the complicated system that we have built meant that they could um, yeah, gain the maximum of falsified votes there. And this is something that you can not only see in Georgia, but also in Moldova. And one could assume that Russia has manipulated the way we voted. And uh, of course, in the future, this might also happen in other European countries, for example, um, EU countries. And of course, we should understand that it's not only Georgia um, and it's n n not only Georgia against Russia. We are all on the same side. We are fighting for democracy and freedom in Georgia and Moldova and Ukraine, uh, first of all, and then, of course, in the EU. So at the moment, when we see authoritarian regimes who come together and attack democracies together, so Russia, North Korea, Iran, China, they are f fighting all over the world against democracy. And a democracy, democracies should be offensive. Democracy, I mean, they should be on the attacking side as well. Uh, democracies should uh, come together and uh, fight together. And um, I think nothing is lost. We will continue with our fight because the Georgian population, um, I mean, there might not be that many people in the streets at the moment in Tbilisi, but I can still remember that in the past it started out with small demonstrations and then suddenly we had 3,000 people in the streets, um, which is a large part of the Tbilisi population. So I think there's still much to do. Our fight will go on. Um. Sergei, let's come back to geopolitics. Uh, the region, as we all know, is uh, quite uh, a complicated uh, geopolitical situation between uh, Russia, Turkey, uh, Central Asia, and Iran. So we have a huge interest uh, in uh, having a um, geopolitical player in the region by the EU that so this region is not given up on one hand. But then on the other hand, one could say that because of that, we have to find a compromise and arrange ourselves and uh, we may not lose Georgia, whatever the government will look like. So this is a country we can make business with, that energy goes through, where in the direct neighborhood we have a stability with uh, because with Turkey and Azerbaijan we do business as well and uh, we arrange ourselves with them as well. So. Is it not uh, unavoidable that uh, we have to be working with uh, Irakli Kubachitze or Ivanishvili to do business as usual? And um, the first person um, congratulating was Viktor Orban that uh, is trying to go down that uh, line. Okay, so that's a reason to not do that if Orban has been the first one to do that. Um, so uh, he did it not only in uh, his uh, position as a president of the EU, but uh, in this position as an authoritarian uh, leader of a country. So it should not uh, be over 
evaluated. Um, this is not necessarily congratulations from the EU. And the question that uh, you have asked before, recognizing or the uh, acknowledgement uh, of uh, the election outcome or the new parliament, this is not something that the European Parliament can do. This is not something that we do. And uh, we have had uh, debates, but this is something that is done by the member states. Only if a sufficient number of member states has acknowledged uh, the electoral outcome, then this legitimacy is created. Uh, but then, of course, in our resolution, as um, I have uh, put it in the text uh, with Putin, we find a wording where we set uh, a signal that we do not acknowledge, we do not recognize the outcome. and. Um, I do not like it. It is a kind of a mean question, but it is a, a, the right question to ask because the one thing may not happen. Of course, we will have to see to the fact that uh, a country like Georgia and the society like uh, the Georgian country may not be left in the hands uh, of Putin. This is a very difficult task for us to do because it's uh, some kind of a dance that we have to do. I think it would be the wrong decision if we, without the support of the Georgian society, therefore it was so important what you said, if we really see that the Georgian society out of itself has this impulse, has this motivation, and they say, no, not with us, then it would be different. But uh, we are not... Uh, um, uh, working in a sphere that uh, is totally out of hand. It is a political decision. And uh, the political decision, of course, is a lot easier to do if we see that we have the same will from the society itself. If we really have the urge to acknowledge or not acknowledge an outcome to support or not to support. So uh, we have to find a way to not do business as usual, but uh, to find a way of how to correct things the way they are, taking into consideration the situation the way it presents itself. So we might have a list of expectations uh, to Georgia in order to go forward with the accession process. And uh, this is something that we have to use as an orientation, uh, seven or nine of those conditionalities that have to be fulfilled in order for the laws that are clearly anti-European have to be taken aback. And I don't have to go into into the two bills that have been drafted, uh, the uh, foreign agents law and the anti-LGBTQI law. So it is quite clear that uh, we cannot accept a country in the EU if the legislation is um, absolutely um, deviated and oriented on what Russia is doing. And then we have a series of reforms that are listed in the conditionalities. And from my perspective, it is not only a question of the legitimacy of the these elections, but of a constitutionality or non-constitutionality of the policy that is done by the governing party. It is not the EU. It should be the Georgian constitution to say that our objective is to become a member of the EU, then the government itself may not insult uh, the EU or uh, talk about the EU the way they do it. So from my perspective, uh, we should basically tell them that this is anti-constitutional, that the rhetoric is not in accordance with your constitution. This is important to us. But uh, the question is, does it mean that we have to cut all relations uh, to Georgia and simply leave them out to dry for Russia, I don't think if this would be the wise decision to make. Um, if we do not have new elections, I think this would be a smarter decision, not a necessary decision, but the smarter decision. If we have this polarization, if there is a split in the society, if uh, we have those allegations, then it would be a lot smarter for the government. If it feels so safe and secure, then please show us that the 54 percent is really what you achieved. Show it to the international community. Please go ahead. This would be the objective. So one 
objective, one goal would be to support the civil society, the pr protests of the civil society, and then we have to see if this all fails, how do we bring this parliament and this society back to the European path, to the European reforms? There's nothing else we can do. Tamta, you have uh, been visiting Brussels uh, these days and have talked uh, to European institutions. Uh, what have been your claims or your demands? Yeah, uh, so uh, as I see among the EU officials, um, maybe politicians as well, uh, the, uh, there are two main paradigm, yeah? Uh, the first paradigm is to uh, like be more tough regarding the Georgia and uh, to be very critical towards the GD government and to somehow cut uh, ongoing relationship and cooperation and even uh, the punish them politically or symbolically uh, and on the, on the other hand uh, the paradigm to to not to use uh, the leverages on GD government and to somehow normalize and uh, uh, negotiate with them uh, to abolish existing uh, anti-constitutional legislation against the NGOs, media and uh, LGBTI people as well uh, can be used for the negotiation as well. Uh, so and yeah, as um, uh, as um, uh, Sergey also uh, explained, uh, a lot of this depended on the processes uh, on the ground in Tbilisi, and of course uh, uh, that our citizens are looking how the, the European Union will act in this situation. But uh, in any case, it's very clear that uh, uh, it's very very clear that uh, GD government is not trusted partner, so they violate a lot of uh, agreements and uh, like the basic um, principle of the game uh, specifically uh, in 2020 remember Sharon Michel's visits in Georgia and how you you um, tried to to you know, participate in the negotiation and the resolvement of the the crisis in Georgia and we see that GD government uh, violated all agreements uh, in this direction yeah uh, so it's really very important to uh, to be very wise and somehow very creative yeah uh, to to in, in this process uh, so um uh, what I wanted to say, like uh, the, in a broad manner, uh, that uh, I really like uh, and maybe love that. Uh, European Union is trying uh, uh, to use this normative approach in foreign policy. And specifically now when globally we see uh, that this logic of authoritarianism and pragmatic politics increasing, it's really very important that you and some part of your politicians continues to uphold normative approach in both domestic and foreign policy. But it's also very clear that uh, uh, in contrast to the imperial policy, policies and high risk posed by Russia, peripheral European states need stronger and more assertive support from the West. Yeah, When we are talking about the security, when we are talking about the uh, democratization and secure, uh, like the, 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 the political processes, welfare, economy, etc. Uh, that's why it's, uh, it's clear for me that when such kind of support uh, is lacking authoritarian political forces, use uh, this uncertainty and ambivalence to turn public opinion against the EU. Uh, so, uh, and now we see that, yeah, Georgian uh, people are actively supporting EU, you know, it's about 80%. And um, no, our citizens have a more pragmatic approach uh, in respect to the EU. They are supporting EU uh, for, because uh, for them the EU is guaranteeing democracy and human rights protection and welfare as well, yeah? So, uh, and of course the security, because we are really very vulnerable country. We can consider, we can uh, assess that Georgia exists in a uh, restricted sovereignty, yeah? Because we are 
uh, we are uh, uh, the, the ongoing annexation uh, of Russia is uh, in phase. Uh, our regions are occupied, and uh, the, the Russia is using very aggressive hybrid war strategies in Georgia as well. Yeah, so it's. Now, in this situation, it's really very important to have very strong support from the, the, the side of the EU uh, to democratic forces and pro-European forces in Georgia. So now, uh, yeah, we are demanding for, from the EU side to have more strict policy regarding uh, the GD government and regarding the Georgia. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, they have to uh, continue support of civil society. They have to strengthen and somehow the political parties in Georgia as well. But, uh, and we should realize that notwithstanding the fact that GD government is uh, shifting in foreign policy from normative to pragmatic, uh, they are becoming closer to Russia and China, but uh, the, the, our financial system, our economic system, our institutional infrastructure in general is not ready to... Uh, be isolated from the Europe, yeah? Because even the trade with Russia or China is not sufficiently strong to substitute European support uh, with the Russian and Chinese support. So now, to be frank, GD government is really very vulnerable because uh, their economy, their financial system is not so strong to be ready for isolation from the from the, the Western support and Western system. And that's why I think that um, you uh, have sufficient uh, resources uh, to somehow be strict in respect to the GD government because. Uh, without uh, support of the EU and the Western partners and very uh, active work uh, in respect to the Georgia, it will be really very difficult for democratic forces of Georgia to, to, to fight and to survive, even to survive, yeah? Because uh, microscopically, GD government is destroying and uh, eroding the trust networks within the society. Yeah, they, they are really very smart, yeah? <laughs> uh, and uh, this uh, huge propaganda, how they are uh, like um, uh, influencing on the cautiousness of our, our citizens, it's also a very huge problem because yes, now, we have 80% of the support, but we see how this uh, uh, far-right uh, pro-Russian hegemony uh, and these discourses are very eff efficiently used by the government to uh, defeat and to weaken this cultural support of the EU, yeah, this ideological support, uh, value-based support of the EU. And I'm really afraid that uh, uh, after several years, there will be less support of the EU if we, uh, if you will lack to really support Georgia now and to stay our country together with Armenia in the gray zone, yeah. And uh, yeah, GD, as GD government is strong, it's not only that Georgian people is supporting them. It's because we are very vulnerable. Uh, and these vulnerabilities are very effectively used by the government. And as they have real support from the side of the Russia. Yeah. So yes, we have Ukraine, but we have our region where Russia is not using the weapon but they are using uh, the propaganda as a weapon. So it's very important for you to have the counter strategy, so how they are dealing with such kind of war coming from the Russia. Now I would like to provide the opportunity to you, but before I have a question to Georgi, Sergei talked about uh, the uh, visa liberalization. A Georgian friend of mine told me just recently that uh, it would possibly be a means, an instrument of pressure for those voters who are afraid who, because of different reasons, because they might have a job or they have some kind of social pressure to vote for the Georgian dream in order to not um, 
abandon the visa liberalization because it's an economic argument uh, in order to have the possibility to freely travel to the EU, to have their jobs done in the EU. And I think this is something that uh, impacts many people beyond the cities. Uh, would it be a good idea to um, abandon the visa liberalization in order to exert some pressure? Very difficult question. Uh, we have a difficult, uh, different um, sides that we have to consider. So, first of all, one could say the Georgian population uh, does not uh, have to be punished by Ivanishvili is doing. Who are the criminal people in our government? Um, so it might not be an ideal decision under these circumstances. On the other hand, what the Georgian dream is dying, doing or has been doing in the past 12 years. He said that uh, Georgia was not supposed to be a problem between the European Union and Russia. Many politicians um, have applauded uh, the decision. And uh, there might be many people who have become tired of the war, the war in Ukraine, and they may try to convince people to simply give up. But um, um, I think uh, the government has succeeded with its propaganda. Back then, they were not able to express clearly that uh, they do not want uh, the uh, European membership or the NATO integration. On the other hand, they have done everything in order to weaken the Georgian state, starting out uh, with the military and the other institutions, step by step. Uh, all the institutions in Georgia have been eroded. We have never had a very strong um, institutional structure, but um, stepwise we have tried to build up the institutions. And now all the institutions in part from the president are um, in the hands of a Russian oligarch that uh, does not really have any clear position. In Ukraine, Russia has started the war for aggression, and uh, the Georgian dream has so uh, shown its real face uh, because it has uh, become more important uh, to take a clear stance. They have used uh, the propaganda from Russia, have supported it, and uh, might have helped uh, Russia in its actions. They keep on saying that uh, they want to join the EU by 2030, and uh, Mr. Orban, when he talked to, to Georgia, then we can see the weakness of the EU. Of course, uh, Orban did not represent e the EU, but uh, Hungary, but uh, the Georgian dream has sold it uh, to the population and to its supporters that uh, now we have the European Union here. We do have forces that support us. Just recently, we had a debate on Georgia in the parliament, in the German parliament, in the bon uh, Bundestag, and uh, the propaganda television has uh, waited in order to interview a member of parliament uh, from uh, the right-wing party, AFD, and he has simply reflected uh, the propaganda of the Georgian dream and of Russia. Coming back to sanctions. Stop liberalization or not? Does it have a negative impact uh, on our civil society? Well, yes, but uh, the Georgian dream wants uh, to integrate Georgia in Russia, but uh, they, of course, uh, have uh, their visas to go to the EU. They have, uh, or they have um, their um, premises and houses in the EU. They send their kids off uh, to study in Europe. Uh, so I do think uh, that it might have an impact on uh, these people, supporters of the Georgian dream, in order for them to understand that uh, the Georgian 
dream will not help us to end up in the European Union. But it might be possible that the uh, same responsible people to sanction them. So the whole system um, is based on fear. And if we have an important person that is sanctioned, others might be more fearful to go down that same way. And then we have the pressure of the civil society and demonstrations on the other hand. So this could show some change. We have to see people taking to the streets. And at the same time, we need clear signs from Europe um, to see to show that uh, the clan-like system is broken up. So we need real sanctions, not against people, not against individuals, but against the clans, the clan-like structures. I, I do understand, and of course I personally would support that. And we will have to wait and see in the upcoming week how the parliament is positioning itself. But we should not forget that uh, too many expectations towards uh, sanctions on persons is not really very useful because we do see the sanction system against Russia, which is quite an extensive uh, system. But of course, we will not be able to cover the family members. I mean, you talked about the children who study elsewhere. So it's the same with, with Russia. I mean, quite the contrary. Sanctions against Prigozhin's mother, for example, and many others were lifted because it was, I mean, despite the fact that it was quite clear that they are responsible uh, for the control of the, the assets of these people. So, I mean, the EU is based on the rule of law and sometimes takes this maybe too serious. Um, I mean, all the legal aspects. Um, this is the reason why we will not have an immediate uh, impact um, I mean, we can do it, maybe, and I would be in favor of that. Uh, but what we cannot do is that economic contacts and cooperation is uh, ended with Georgia, hoping that this would put enough pressure on the country. I don't think that this would be the right path, because we would then uh, push Georgia into the arms of Russia. Uh, I mean, this is my concern. I mean, we have also seen how relatively quickly it can happen that products are being replaced, uh, that markets are being replaced. And I think the Kremlin is simply waiting for Ishvanishvili and all his buddies uh, that they call the Kremlin and tell them, well, the market is now open for you. So this is really my concern. I think we have to exert pressure. We have to be very determined regarding our actions on both sides. But we should not overdo it and send a signal of uh, like breaking up the, the relations or ending the relations. I think this would not be the right perspective for the Georgian population in the long run. May I briefly answer to it? I mean, I do not uh, support an end of the relations with Georgia. But when it, I mean, we have been talking about the sanctioning of individuals since spring. So, quite a long time, and since the, the laws were discussed, so since then, we have been discussing sanctions. And I know that it's very complicated to do this, for example, to end visa-free travel for Georgians, of course. Uh, 27 different um, countries would have to um, vote in favor of it. It's difficult, quite clear. But I just wanted to 
to say that in Georgia we have a slightly different structure compared to Russia. So in Russia, we have not seen a free society since Putin has been in office, and he's been in office for quite a long time. In Georgia, uh, the Georgian dream is trying to suppress civil society, but it's still there. I mean, it uh, is stronger than it has ever been before. So I would say that a first step, I mean, that uh, Orban goes to Tbilisi and says, well, uh, Georgia will be an EU member in 2030, and that this is being um, sent throughout the state-run TV channels, then, of course, it's very difficult to convince people that the Georgian dream is not in favor of the EU. So if an official representative of the EU would have come and said, no, the German uh, dream, uh, sorry, the Georgian dream will not lead Georgia into the EU, uh, it would have been helpful, but this was not what happened. And the way it turned out, the Georgian dream could convince many people. Well, but of course, we have to say that over the past months, I mean, quite late, but uh, eventually politicians from the EU um, regularly and uh, frequently appeared in Georgia and also the ambassadors, also the German ambassador and also the European ambassador has quite clearly stated that the EU integration is not in line with the LGBTQI uh, law and the foreign agents law. And the commission um, has changed uh, considerably here. Um, we've just heard uh, from Georgi that the civil society is quite strong. This is also what my experience is. But now it is under severe pressure through the new laws. So uh, what do you expect? Do you think there will be a strict implementation of the foreign agents law, which might become an existential threat for NGOs because they have to yeah, say that they are foreign agents because there's a huge administrative burden put on them because um, they could be hampered in their political work. So do we have to expect a clear deterioration um, for the uh, Georgian uh, public? Thank you for this question. Um, yes, so you know that um, uh, GD government is trying to uh, shrink the, the democratic space and uh, adopted uh, different laws against uh, the civil society organizations and media. Uh, and um, I can say that um, it's really important to know why they are doing uh, this. Yeah, uh, Of course, first of all, um, because uh, the civil society organizations uh, are really very strong in Georgia as a sector and as institutions. Yeah, They have very well developed infrastructure. We have very good coordination. We are very active, maybe more active internationally than uh, Georgian government, uh, uh, etc. Moreover, we managed uh, like big, massive rallies and protests during the crisis, and all these protests in Tbilisi uh, were also organized by the civil society organizations. So, uh, GD government see the threats for um, for them uh, when they are dealing or approaching the civil society organizations. Uh, that's why the, they are really interested to destroy us institutionally, and they are doing. Uh, for um, at this moment, um, they are not implementing the law, uh, so there is no any fines or monitoring process against us. But of course, we are expecting that uh, after, as soon as uh, issues related elections will be decided, managed, they will start aggressive implementation um, of this law. 
Uh, so in this situation, of course, we have uh, the, the, some strategies how to rearrange re our work uh, and to see new legal ways for operation. But of course, it will weaken uh, the, the sector uh, seriously. But uh, what is the interesting that uh, uh, the development of civil society in Georgia was uh, historically like there was uh, um, uh, the uh, top-down process. Yeah, it was uh, the organizations who uh, established the support of the different international organizations. Um, but now we see that due to this crisis and uh, like the very unique self-organization of our citizens, uh, the civil society is burning from the, the, the button up from the grassroots. And we see uh, the students in different universities, including in regional universities, uh, in different small cities, uh, uh, like the ordinary people, how they, they are trying to be self-organized and to resist and to reveal solidarity to each other, etc. So now this attack on institutional sector of civil society um, uh, cause uh, the, 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 the strengthening of the, the grassroots movements and uh, uh, self-organization. Self so it's really uh, very important. But of course, um, if uh, the funding uh, will be the problem in the future for the, uh, the, the society organizations, specifically online medias, because they are uh, totally dependent on the, 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 the Western support and the donor support, and then of course it will be really Really very difficult to, to, to continue uh, our struggle. And it's also very important to note that um, uh, when we have the crisis with opposition, somehow uh, civil society is, uh, the, the, is the space where we are trying to develop some progressive agenda. Yeah, We are trying to support uh, environmental protests, uh, worker strikes and protests, uh, the minority struggle, um, queer struggles, etc. So in this situation, it will be really very difficult to continue our work for progressive uh, just agenda uh, and uh, like the, 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 the work. Um, and specifically when we are talking about the importance of the polarization, uh, like the, 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 the actors, civil society media actors who have this progressive agenda, um, we are the people who who are able to somehow uh, depolarize the, the environment, yeah, to not speak about what Misha Sakash really wants and Bidzne really, but what uh, is the real grievances and the needs of of the, the population of different social groups. So yeah, uh, if we will be weak, I think that this polarization and uh, direct control and influence of the, the citizens will be increased, and it will be really very difficult to protect the, the real interests of the people. So um, it's really very important for uh, international organizations to continue the support of uh, not only the NGOs, but different initiative groups, collectives, movements. It's really very important to decentralize this support and our vision of the, 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 the civil society in Georgia uh, and uh, to uh, prioritize uh, uh, not only the political issues, but also the social environmental issues as well, yeah? Because when I'm uh, like the measuring the, the amount of the support or priorities of international organizations, we see that even these organizations are missing the importance um, to work on social and economic environmental injustices, yeah? Like these grievances, which is like uh, the mostly important and uh, um, most important for the majority of the population, yeah? And one of the reasons why we see mistrust towards the, uh, the, 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 the actors, political or semi-political actors uh, in Georgia, it's uh, the, the feeling of our society that their real interests are not properly articulated and represented by the parties or even the big uh, mainstream NGOs. And it's really very important to think more how our work can be more transformative and more closer towards the uh, interests of, uh, of the society. So yeah, the continuation is important, but 
also important it's important to uh, change uh, the, the agenda and priority of uh, donor or big international organizations so this is actually the hope that the crisis might turn into a renewal of society and of politics in the medium run so now I would like to uh, open up for questions and comments for the last 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, we have a microphone over there. So please briefly introduce yourself so that we know who you are. Hello, my name is Ulrike Gorochatz. I am a German Georgian lawyer, and my question goes to Mr. Lagodinsky. So you said certain sanctions cannot be implemented because the rule of law does not allow for it. For example, sanction against family members, etc. But I tend to think, well, democracy is losing the battle against authoritarian regimes if you continue like that. And the sanctions that are on the table, like visa-free travel or uh, the approach to the EU, the involvement in the EU, the Georgian government does not want it. And so this means that you could would punish the wrong people. I do expect that the government will further escalate and that they will detain uh, demonstrators and also shut down critical media. And does the EU have a plan B, how you want to react to it or what you're going to do? So we will collect three questions first. There's another hand over here. Well, despite all, could you please briefly introduce yourself, Carsten Lindloff? I've been to Georgia this year, and so I'm very interested in the situation in the country. So this country, which is in between the EU and maybe also the economic relations with Turkey and Russia, and um, also in reality, in between all the different interests and stakeholders. However, my question goes to you, what is being lost um, due to all the polarization. But um, how do you assess the electorate of the Georgian dream? Do they want closer relations with Russia? And this is why they elect or vote for the Georgian dream, or are they voting in favor for more uh, security and less confrontation with Russia? So these would be different uh, aspects. So maybe I'll stick to this very brief question. Thank you. And then another question over here. Uh, Thank you. I am Gal Gorze, also a co-founder of the Georgian Center Abroad. I've got two questions referring to the same aspect. I mean, there's much talk about what kind of value added a new membership would have for Georgia, but I would also like to ask the opposite question, what's the value added for the EU through the integration of the countries like Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova? And in this regard, I've got two questions. First to Mr. Lagodinsky. As uh, the previous uh, speaker has already asked, I mean, if we do see that the sanction regime that we have sticks to rules, rules that are coming from a much smaller European Union. When do when we do realize that this sanction regime does not work, and it does not work because we are faced with criminals. They are simply criminals. They are stealing money from the Georgian population. They have gathered power, and then through their family members or themselves, they use the money here to do business and try to legalize their money here and use it here. So that we have a system which is a good system, but it is simply not in line with the challenges. So what could be a reform potential? Uh, so this is the first question, reform potential. And uh, to Ms. Chicha Ratze, and this is a big question. From your point of view, why? is the European society also in Europe. Why is the society here not more committed when it comes to questions of democracy and freedom? Why don't we 
see more people in the streets here. I mean, I know that we are here in some kind of bubble. I've got many friends who are very concerned about Georgia and the fate of democracy in Georgia. But in the overall population, I do not see this kind of commitment. And why is this the case from your point of view? And where's a potential for more? How can we achieve more commitment from society? So maybe let's start with Sergei. Questions on sanctions. I'm a big uh, fan of reforming the sanctioning mechanism within the EU. But um, I'm not in favor of um, doing away with um, the rule of law when we talk about reforms. There are forms that are necessary. And uh, we don't even need reforms. We simply have to come together with the, um, the, the EU institutions simply have to do their work. Um, the DG Finn, for example. So there is no sanctioning regime um, via Georgia. So I do take the example of Russia. If we have problematic uh, agents or the criminals, so to say, in Russia. So, who decides who ends up on the list? So, with the Russian oligarchs, we have seen that uh, the decision has been made uh, with the help of Wikipedia articles. This is not a possibility. We totally discredit the whole system. It is really like that. We have people ending up on the list because of the Wikipedia articles. So who are crossed out of the list? We have seen uh, with the number of board Financial Times articles, people have been deleted because in these articles, people have claimed that they're not really that bad as that. That is totally, it's not serious at all. So. We have to include professional structures uh, to change that. This is what happens. When I talk to Kaya Kalas, this is something that we would like to push forward. We need a focus on our sanctioning regime. So we need uh, an update um, of, the, of the sanctions, the way they are implemented in the EU institutions. The war of aggression has started after the commission being built up and all the structures being built up. Now we have the opportunity to do it differently. The commission has not been yet established and I don't know how we are going to do that. Uh, but when I look towards Kaya Kalas, I know they do have some understanding for it because they have a different kind of thinking as compared to Joseph Borrell. And um, if we have people from the Baltic states, uh, people from Eastern Europe, from Poland, who are responsible for the budget, I really hope that we can count on a different mindset when it comes to sanctions, sanctions that are not directed against individuals. We have that in Russia. Some people claim that we need the same for Georgia. We need a horizontal sanctioning system. We have different sanction regimes. It is not one regime, not one scheme, but because of different reasons, the annexation of Crimea, then we have a violation of human rights here, and then we have the war of aggression in Ukraine. Those are different sanction schemes. And if we have those different schemes, then it's a lot easier for Russia to deviate it, uh, to um, find a workaround. And what you have just addressed, uh, if uh, we want to include family members or not, in a country where we have the rule of law, the courts and tribunals will look into it. Um, I have suggested several times so that uh, uh, sanctions uh, can be left outside of the legal system, and we do it like the U.S. is doing it. We convert it into a political instrument, and I fought for it, um, but it's quite difficult because the uh, legal basis for sanctions in is part of uh, the treaties, and uh, this is something we cannot go around. This is something that can always be assessed uh, it is not a EU problem. Um, the sanctions have been lifted, if I do recall right, uh, from the UK, from uh, tribunals uh, in London. So this was outside the EU. 
I think they are saying that uh, we lose uh, them to the authoritarian regimes. Uh, but um, the question is, um, how much do we lose uh, from ourselves? And if uh, we um, deny part of our own democratic thinking, this is uh, why I don't really like to be as resistant uh, for Germany. I want us to be resilient. Um, because of resistance um, here in Germany, um, this, this debate is reduced to, to resistance, but it's about resilience. And what is resilience? Resilience is uh, the ability of a society, even under stress, to regenerate, to come back to democratic structures and norms. And this is what I want us to become, to become more stress resistant in order to not lose our values, but I don't want us to be naive. So this is what I talked about. We need hard power. We have uh, to invest in our ability to defend ourselves, and we have to show the seriousness of our support uh, against those countries uh, like uh, the Moldova. Moldova, Georgia, and uh, Armenia. These are three countries where we, as uh, EU, have uh, to express clearly that this uh, is not our sphere of influence. Uh, I leave that for others uh, to decide over that. But those are countries that we perceive as part of our zone of interest. So with Azerbaijan, you can make your mind up of what you want to do with Azerbaijan. But these three countries have um, decided consciously, well, Armenia more or less, but they have decided to become members of the EU. We respect that choice, and uh, this choice is um, irreversible. And we claim our interests and our solidarity for these countries. So what kind of instruments we use is a different kind of story. But I want us to have a bit more of a stance uh, of a position as EU. Yeah, now we come up with the next question to Georgi, the uh, position solidarity. And um, if I understood Gaga right, it's about uh, the solidarity in the German society. How do you perceive that? So what are the reasons why we have uh, not sufficient solidarity here in Germany, as Gaga put it? That's a good question and quite complicated at the same time. We may find different reasons for that. But it's a fact that um, that the problems are such that we do not have sufficient clarity. So we have different generations uh, that did not go through these processes. Throughout my whole life, uh, from uh, the Stone Age, uh, we have uh, developed uh, the 21st century. When I was a kid, we didn't have any heating. We didn't have electricity. And um, we had to, to live in a shared flat because uh, in order to survive. But we did have a dream. We wanted to cut Georgia out of that region and to put it somewhere else, shift it to somewhere where it's out of the influence of Russia. And this is the only possibility that this dream comes true, to become members of the EU and NATO. Because if we are under the shield of protection, then uh, we have really have cut Georgia out of its region and have put it under the protection of the West. Back to your question. Once we have gone through this whole process and have seen that uh, empathy for people who are fighting for freedom, is, yes, of course you understand that. If someone in Georgia, Armenia, in Moldova is suppressing a free person, that this does affect me as a person. It touches me because I am an individual myself. 
And I think it's important to, to fight for our freedoms on a daily basis. And if we do that, then you have more empathy when others do the same thing. We do have many people in the German society who do support us and at least verbally are by our side. But it's important to understand that we need more action, not only words. We should show what an added value would Georgia bring to the EU, what kind of benefits uh, Georgia as a democratic would have for Germany as a country. We do have that experience. For 30 years, we are fighting for a better country, for better lives, and we have gone through the times to know how to survive, to know how to get out of the worst situations. And uh, we do think that uh, the EU is a lot better than what it actually is because we think that uh, there is a lot of freedom and justice. We do think that uh, EU can do it better, and uh, we do have this faith from Georgia, uh, Moldova. So we have this authentic faith in the Union as it was in the beginning. And uh, some countries might have lost it uh, because of the bureaucracy that it brings with it. Yeah, so dream has, as a word has not been discredited by the Georgian dream. So you can keep on talking about a dream. Tamta, last question to you about the motives of those uh, who have voted for the Georgian dream. We've talked a lot about manipulation, intimidation, but there surely are people who are convinced voters of the Georgian dream. What are they moved by? This is at least how I understand the question. Uh, so now it's uh, very difficult for me to um, like uh, exactly share with you uh, what is the motivations of the voters of GD. Um, so we are uh, talking about the instrumentalization of the public employees and uh, socially vulnerable people uh, aggressively by the uh, side of GD government. Like to give you some statistics, uh, 700,000 citizens are getting social assistance I mentioned, yeah? And we have 300,000 uh, people uh, who are employed in the public uh, service. So there are one million people, a uh, third part of our population who is directly, uh, monthly dependent uh, economically and uh, financially on, on the government and on the state. So, uh, so it's very clear for me that these numbers uh, influenced uh, on the support of the GD government. On the other hand, uh, what is uh, manipul like the instrumentalized by the government? Yeah, first of all, it is the fears related to the war, uh, and um, we see uh, how the the issue of the war in Ukraine was actively uh, explored or used by the uh, GD government. So in the past, um, uh, so in, from to 2012, uh, the uh, Georgian government's uh, foreign policy um, um, was characterized as a policy of non-provocation towards the Russia and policy of European integration. Yeah, So it was somehow rational, especially after the August wine 2008. And this policy was defined by the dynamics of normalization and balance between uh, the, the different actors. But now it's very clear that this policy is changing and, um, and uh, this balance has been disrupted with the European Union and Western partners. And specifically now when after the war in Ukraine, we together with Moldova uh, have um, historical chances to become the, the member of the European Union. They are doing everything to lose these chances. But unfortunately, this factor uh, was not sufficiently supported by uh, our population. And the fears related to the war, um, like there was more and higher than the understanding of this historical opportunity. Yeah. So, 
specifically after the full scale war in Ukraine, I have this feeling that post Soviet states and societies would reassess the role of the Russia and seek to distance themselves uh, from the Russia. And specifically, we see this tendency in Armenia, in Moldova as well, and in our society as well. But paradoxically, a Georgian government and politicized these fears uh, of the war and directly contributed to strengthen the role of the Russia, the political fact factor of the Russia in our collective consciousness, in political discourse, etc. So that's why there was this um, conflict between the European future and the existing threats which were exaggerated by the GD government and finally for the people this security oriented approach was more acceptable than future-oriented, uh, progressive, positive approach. And lastly, it's economical factor, I can uh, say, because uh, as I am observing uh, the, the some economic dynamics in Georgia, we see how did the government properly manage to use uh, these uh, after-war economic contexts, and uh, they are considering Georgia as a Corridor between the uh, the Western companies and Central Asia Chinese companies, and uh, they managed to have some economic growth in the country. Of course, it's uh, cynical when we are talking about uh, about the economic growth and uh, support of his, this idea from the people, because, for example, um, in Georgia, the combined income of the baton 50 percent has been less than that of the top one percent since 2013. Yeah, for example, uh, approximately 25% of the employed individuals, it's about uh, more than uh, 300,000 workers, earned less than a state-defined minimum su su subsistence level. Like, like we are talking about uh, strong uh, eco economic inequality and poverty, but notwithstanding this fact, this economic growth also influenced on the political choice of the, the citizens. So all, all these bigger, the arguments related to the war and economic growth, that's Political stability is the way to become the richer, uh, like worked, I can say, in our society. And together with this instrumentalization and fraud we mentioned, they managed to, 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 to mobilize the people. But we cannot say that all GD supporters are pro-Russians. On the contrary, GD is trying to convince the people that they will promote uh, um, final Europeanization of the country. But they say that now it's not the time for Europeanization because we need stability and the policy, pragmatic policy. And then in the future, when the war will end, we will manage Europeanization. But of course, it's the totally wrong. <laughs> promise because they are not structurally European, they are not uh, democratically um, uh, uh, democratic uh, itself uh, and of course uh, this break when we see uh, progress in the Europeanization process of Moldova and uh, uh, Ukraine and we see this uh, uh, backsliding in Georgia we have feeling that we are losing uh, the, the European opportunities, yeah, and even it uh, is you uh, changing the political geography of Georgia because in the the la, uh, recent years Georgia considered as a part of Europe Eastern Europe but now we considered as a part of <laughs> more South Caucasus Caucasia uh, and we are becoming closer with the uh, Armenia and, and Azerbaijan and uh, we see that uh, this uh, political geography is also changing and yeah it will be very difficult to uh, to return the, um, uh, the, the, the existing point. Good, vielen Dank. Um. Oh, many, many thanks, Tamta, for your insights. Uh, thank you, Georgi. Thank you, Sergei, for this uh, quite sobering debate uh, that has shown quite clearly how difficult the situation is in Georgia for Georgians, but as well for those who are in the European Union who uh, want to react uh, on it in a helpful way. I don't know how you feel, but uh, I think I leave this debate with a little bit more of optimism because I have the feeling that there is a lot of momentum and um, there were moments that have shown that um, we 
not everything is over. Well, nothing's over ever in history. But uh, talking about the current situation, we still have uh, some hope. There have been some good moments, some good ideas, some creative ideas uh, to think about uh, how we could approach that situation. And um, I'm quite sure that Georgia will be able to go down the European way. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, I would like to invite you for some pretzels and uh, drinks uh, afterwards. Uh, thank you so much uh, to our two interpreters tonight um, for facilitating. And uh, I would be happy to see you back here next time. Good evening.